Hey everybody, I'm Christian Wentling. Let's talk about GraphQL. GraphQL is a query language for APIs and a server-side runtime for executing those queries. Before we jump into it, uh, it's typical to talk about REST a little bit and see why it's necessary to have some kind of alternative for that uh, for serving data to our applications. Um, which is a good question, by the way, because even though this is new and cool, um, we already have uh, RESTful APIs that seem to work pretty well with our applications. Um, and so I'd like to just spend a second on that before jumping into how GraphQL works. Um, and uh, principally, I'd like to focus my presentation on synthesizing some of the tutorials and some of the, the videos that you might see out there um, so you can decide whether or not you might like to devote a little bit more time and energy uh, into learning about it. So uh, REST. You may be surprised to learn this, but there are actually people on the internet who are out there arguing about what this means. Um, probably not, though. Uh, RESTful state transfer uh, can be a little bit of a, a vague or a complex topic if you ask some people, but um, for the most part, we already know what this is. Um, it's fundamentally just when we have uh, a unique uh, identifier that's persistent uh, for resources. Um, and when we have a consistent set of verbs, uh, get, post, put, and delete, that we can use to uh, manipulate those resources. Um, so in a typical uh, REST application, we'll have you know, something like, in our puppy book example, um, slash puppies, slash one, and we can either we can get that resource, uh, we can make a request where we ask for it to be sent back uh, to the client, we can send a post request if we want to create a new instance. We can do a put request to modify it, and we can delete it. Um, and REST is a set of principles, architectural principles that are, that are now prevalent, which dictates that we can't just say, uh, I'm going to send a, a get request, and it's going to actually modify the instance um, instead of just bringing it back to me. Um, so this is, you know, a really good way of organizing things. I think it's intuitive, um, it's well structured, um, and importantly, the client doesn't need to know about the API's structure. Um, they just, you know, need to send get requests or put requests or whatever, um, and they'll get what they need on the front end. So those are the advantages, um, but let's take a look at a couple of potential disadvantages uh, in certain situations. Um, when we send a GET request for something, we're going to get back a pretty standard response from the endpoint. And this is actually an example I got from my uh, Stackathon project. Um, I really liked working with this API that sent back uh, this response here, but it's got all kinds of stuff that I don't need, which is costly for the provider of the API to provide to me, and it makes it more difficult uh, for me as the application developer um, to get what I need to show uh, my users. Um, so that's not ideal, um, and if it gets even more complicated if you have different kinds of clients um, and situations where you might need to create different custom endpoints, that can be really difficult to scale and to maintain, um, and there's just a potential, a greater potential for error uh, in those situations. So. I think Facebook probably you know, had the greatest need to, to look at other ways of doing this since they have a really uh, you know, a complex uh, data structure. You know, they have a, a graph right, of, of us and all of our friends. Um, and starting in about 2012, they put GraphQL into practice. Um, initially, I believe, uh, it was developed by the product infrastructure team. Uh, for uh, serving data to mobile news feeds. Um, essentially, I, I, from what I uh, have read and, and learned, um, they needed a way to get data to those news feeds over what were potentially bad connections. So if you think back to the, um, the preview of the response that I just showed you, in my application where I was getting a bunch of other uh, data from, from that API, I had to then send back a whole bunch of other requests in response to that one to get what I finally needed. And GraphQL is great because it allows us just to interact with a single endpoint and you have the ability to ask for uh, 
things which are nested inside of fields, um, which is really valuable um, and a lot more efficient. GraphQL is both a query language and a server-side uh, environment for executing those queries. Um, but it also fits in well with what we've learned so far in that it's declarative um, and allows us just to describe uh, the data that we need and without necessarily saying how we would get it. Um, it works with a number of different languages. You can implement a GraphQL service um, in JavaScript or in Python or in Ruby. Um, and it's not a, a query language for getting stuff from a database. You're not going to replace SQL with, with GraphQL. Um, this is for configuring your API um, for the application. So let's look a little bit at, at the details. Um, and so just keep in mind that I'm going to be showing some code from a JavaScript implementation of a GraphQL service. Uh, but the actual GraphQL language is something that we're going to look at, hopefully, just for a couple of minutes at the very end of the demo, um, just to see kind of that side of it. And that's um, going to be, if you're on the front end and, and you need something from the API, that's where you'll be interacting with it. And this is how you'll get it set up initially. So just a brief overview here of some of the central features of the language. Um, and again, this is just very 101. Um, you know, you're going to when you're creating a new GraphQL service, uh, you're going to define a set of types. Um, and these are going to describe the data that you can get from the service. Um, and as queries come in, they're going to get uh, validated. And uh, the schema is going to say, OK, that's a valid request. Send back data. So object types are kind of the most um, fundamental uh, you know, unit um, in GraphQL. Um, and then we have, within them, uh, three different special uh, object types. Um, and the most prevalent ones are these queries and mutations. Queries essentially replace get requests. Mutations are like put and post requests where you can modify and create resources. Subscriptions are really new and kind of still in development, um, but they are what you would think. Uh, essentially, it's a persistent uh, request uh, for something, like a kind of a get request. Um, and it'll send back data as there are changes uh, to the server. So queries, uh, this is pretty standard. You'll see this in mutations as well if we look ahead. Um, they're just going to have fields here for, say, um, puppies. Um, you know, and uh, you know, you're going to give it different arguments. So uh, a puppy is going to have a breed. Um, and that's how you're going to be able to query for a puppy. Um, and the same with mutation. Um, but both of these will also include resolve methods, which tell you um, how you can get that data. They describe that. So in this case, um, you're going to send, uh, you know, in the case of a query, you have uh, puppy.findAll. In the case of a mutation, you have puppy.create. And finally, this schema um, essentially knits everything together um, and acts um, really prescribes how we can interact with our data. Um, I would, is I think the best uh, summation of essentially what uh, a schema is in GraphQL. So uh, let's look at how we actually use this for just a second. We'll take a quick peek at a JavaScript implementation. Um, and then we will um, you know, take a quick look at some actual GraphQL. So if I can just get my cursor back here, I'm going to see some code. Got it. Great. Um, so here we have our, our package JSON. We can see there's a couple other dependencies that we're going to install for this one. Um, obviously, we've got GraphQL. Um, we've got Postgres here. Um, 
We've got Webpack, we've got Babel. Uh, we're also going to use this Express middleware for GraphQL called Express GraphQL. Um, very simple uh, database here, um, just with a, a puppy model and a, a human friend model. Um, I think you guys are all familiar with this. Um, and then here's the schema. Um, you guys have already just seen the code for this. Um, we've got uh, a puppy and a human friend, and we've got a query, and we've got a mutation, and we've got the schema that pulls it all together. Um, and then lastly, just wanted to mention this real quick. Uh, if you're just trying to get started and, and play around with this a little bit, I found this just a, a little bit tricky, um, just that you'll need to um, have both a GraphQL server and probably your, your app server as well, um, just to get the ball rolling. So that's what it looks like in JavaScript. And if we open up, um, so localhost uh, 3000, we get to use this IDE um, that's provided to us by GraphQL um, and that we can use to validate our queries, um, and which is really pretty neat. So in this case, we can look over here. We've got an error right now. But look, it'll tell us what's available in query. We can do puppies. So let me press the play button. Oh, and look, there's something there. And we, it automatically populates all these. But what if we don't need those two things? We can just get rid of them like that and say, all right, will this still work? Can we just get name off all of our puppies? Yes, we can. Um, and similarly, we can do this with, uh, with mutations um, and store things in our database pretty easily. So if we take a really quick look, um, we want to add a puppy, we press play here, and we get a syntax error. So we're just going to make this image a lot shorter, just in case that's the issue. OK, so that normally would work, um, but I shouldn't have tried to do uh, any form of live coding. Um, but I highly encourage you all to look, more, look into GraphQL a little bit more. Um, I think it is a really exciting, uh, really developing uh, technology that we're probably all going to be using a lot. Um, and it's got a really robust, um, vibrant ecosystem of new tools, uh, people teaching each other new techniques. Um, Facebook is uh, still developing it, so um, I think it's definitely a worthwhile investment. Um, and I've listed out my sources here, so I'll send those out in case you're interested in taking a look. Thanks so much.